Our story begins on a cold and most probably rainy night in London, as the suits and ladies in mink coats make their way to the Clermont Club, where they'd soon be all warm and fuzzy with the thrill of gambling and dreams of bringing back the days of the good old empire. For you see, the Clermont Club was a dig in Mayfair, frequented by more millionaires, earls, dukes and cabinet members that you could shake a stick at. Among this otherwise weak chin crowd, there was a steely blue-eyed bastard by the name of Sir James Goldsmith. And yes, he's a sir because you can always trust the royals to be great judges of character as we know. Do I regret the fact that, that, that he has quite obviously conducted himself in a manner unbecoming? Yes. Unbecoming? He was a sex offender? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm being polite. Over the course of his life, Jim managed to build up quite a resume, from fresh-faced eloper with the heiress of a fortune, to venal corporate raider, to environmentalist colonialist and eventually pioneer Brexiteer. In short, uh, Goldsmith was uh, always putting himself about. And uh, it's only fitting to make him the protagonist of this episode, because of all the awful ways in which the man left his mark on the world, James Goldsmith was also one of the pioneers of what is now labelled the environmentalism of the rich, or conservation financing, because for everyone who doesn't own a spaceship that they occasionally use to blow up other people with, caring about the environment is about the necessities of life about the simple yet baffling concept of surviving on this planet without destroying it, or humanity, for that matter, in the process. Now, if you are one of the boys, and it's mostly boys, of the 1% club, and you've got money coming out of orifices you didn't even know the human body possessed, well, then, my friend, environmentalism is something completely different. It becomes a tool with which you make sure that no one blocks the endless supply of gold to your ever-expanding hoard. What you do is you take a look at all the resources people have been sharing freely and using communally, and uh, you start putting up fences. Now, some of these fences are quite literal enclosures. However, if you are a developing country, suffocated by debt you can't repay, you might just find you are in possession of some rivers, lakes, forests that you can spare. Here, I'll uh, hold them for you and um, we'll pretend the debt just went poof. We'll call it that for nature swap. <laughs> what? No, you can't have it back, you silly thing. It's a protected area now. Besides, Jimmy told me you can't have it cause you'd break it. Fuck you, Jimmy. Part 1. The boy who would be rich, because he already was and married an heiress anyway. James Goldsmith grew up as the son of luxury hotel tycoon and conservative MP Major Frank Goldsmith. I don't know about your spawn point, but it's probably better than what most of us could hope for. One of Jimmy Boy's first noteworthy exploits happened in his early 20s, when he eloped with his first of several wives, Bolivian heiress Isabel Patino. And for those of you wondering, eloped is one of those words that people with money use when they feel like being naughty. Poor people and tired millennials, by contrast, just don't have enough money to marry nor have enough bars on their mental health meter to put up with the stress of having a wedding. Now, sadly for all those involved, the romance between Isabel and James was short-lived as she died while giving birth to the couple's daughter, also named Isabel. Struck with grief, Goldsmith turned to fortune building to, I don't know, I guess, center himself? And the best way to build is to smash and grab. So Jim got into the business of taking over and breaking up companies. 
and just on cue, because right around that time, this unassuming accountant slash game theorist called Jim Slater decided to do away with the relative stability and dullness that defined the world of financing after the Great Depression and get some swag back into the game. Slater performed what became known as corporate raids, getting shares in companies he wanted to take over, then using shareholder voting rights to influence decisions made by said companies. Things like the sale of certain assets or layoffs, you know, the small stuff, don't sweat it. But enough of this Jimmy, let's get back to our Jimmy. Newspapers called Goldsmith a cynical vulture who dismantled the big names within the manufacturing industry, but he insisted, and seemed to be quite convinced himself, that he was merely giving these complacent companies back their initial vigor. But um, America has great vigor, great individual vigor. Incredibly vigorous individuals that exist in America. Vigor. Vigor. He was making them strip down and give him 20 to then go and endure the cold shower of the free market like the true Spartan baby warriors there was supposed to be. By the 1980s, he was by no means the only one to engage in such practices. A 1999 documentary by Adam Curtis called The Mayfair Set goes into the nitty-gritty of Goldsmith and other Clermont Club members' exploits in the business world, but we're here for something else. Part 2. Is that, is that eugenics in my soup? While Jim was busy raiding businesses, his brother Teddy founded The Ecologist magazine and became one of the most prominent figures of the British Green Party. And as the two brothers were fairly close, there was a certain osmosis of ideas between their membranes. Both James and his brother were strongly opposed to pesticides, for example, and advocated organic farming. They were also strongly against the nuclear power industry. But Jim's otherwise affable-looking brother was not exactly a vest-wearing version of a tree hugger. In 1997, editorial staff at his own magazine resigned in protest at Teddy attempting to reach out to the French far right to argue that green politics was about a natural, a natural social, social order, order with, with fixed, fixed tribal identities. identities. Not a good look, Teddy. Not a good look. And uh, that's the issue, really, if you dare to look close enough. The environmentalism of the rich demonstrates this very um, ominous brand of care towards nature that is uh, thoroughly soaked in disgust towards other people. Take, for instance, the words of John Aspinall, founder of the Clermont Club. Aspinall loved animals, and his 1976 book, titled Best of Friends, featured touching images of close human interactions with apes and big cats. However, the book also contained Aspinall's comments on his fellow man. Homo sapiens finds itself in an uncontrolled, cancerous growth and medical research has merely exacerbated this condition with the billions blown on letting unworthy people live. Of course, posh eugenicists are always under the impression that they themselves have those good genes, so life isn't really wasted on them. Also, the good stuff gets passed down, you know, like that snazzy chateau. In the words of Francis Galton, the OG of eugenics, lords breed lords. Aspinall himself wrote that the science of high-ranking parents are probably the beneficiaries of genetic as well as cultural superiorities. Concluding handily that aristocracy in its literal sense of rule by the best could well be the best of all rules. So you see, the problem is all of us non-billionaires stinking up the place. And if we want to save the bees, we really need to shut our mouths and listen to whoever is cracking that whip because they just know best. Armed with such ideas about ecology, Goldsmith set out to find his own little piece of paradise. Part 3. Paradise Lost? No, Paradise Mine! 
Jim retired to Mexico in 1987, where one of his daughters inherited a property near the Colima volcano in the Costa Alegre region. He converted the 800 hectare estate, known as the Quixmala Hacienda, into his private residence and built a sumptuous mansion with an 180 degree view of the Pacific Ocean. He also built several residences and villas to house distinguished guests such as Richard Nixon, Henry Kissinger, Ronald Reagan and Bill Gates. Guests that will come in handy, as we shall see. What attracted Goldsmith to Costa Alegre was the privacy and exclusivity it offered to himself and his high-flying guests. Until the mid-20th century, few people lived in the area, as the swamps, rugged vegetation and swarms of mosquitoes weren't exactly most people's idea of a friendly, welcoming committee. During the 1940s, and especially in the 1950s, a policy called the March to the Sea was launched in Mexico's coastal zones. The idea was to encourage people to live and farm in these areas by creating ejidos, communal lands under the control of the government, in which members of the community had the right to use the land indefinitely, provided they fulfilled certain conditions. This went on until the 1960s, when the government decided they would rather shore up the interests of private property owners and developers. First, a new highway was built to ease access to the region. Secondly, the government pushed for a federal cattle ranching policy that led to the destruction of significant stretches of forest, freeing up previously inaccessible lands for construction. Club Med, an exclusive worldwide hotel chain frequented by the Jet Set, was among the first to be built in the area. Now, let's talk a bit about the entrepreneurial magic required to suddenly grab vast swaths of land in a foreign country. For one thing, since Mexico's general law on national assets forbade the acquisition of coastal lands by foreigners, using trust to purchase land under borrowed names was an often used method. People already settled in ejidos nearby were bought off, and through various decrees, the new owners were given guarantees that their lands would never be subject to expropriation, and that no new communal lands would be approved on or near their property. Where locals made too much noise and wouldn't allow themselves to be bought out for pennies, buyers had the support of public officials, hired muscle, as well as your friendly neighborhood cop to sort out any wrinkles. Profiting off the turmoil surrounding the future of some ejido projects located around his initial estate, Goldsmith eventually managed to lay his hands on 32,000 acres of forest, mangrove swamps and beaches. He used guards to forcibly remove any of the previous inhabitants and destroyed all remnants of human settlements. With the reform of Article 27 of the Constitution of Mexico in 1992, ejido leaders and indigenous communities were pressured into selling some of the best land across the Pacific and Caribbean coasts. That same year, Goldsmith started weaponizing environmentalist sentiments by framing his land grab as a way to create natural protected areas. The aim was not only to privatize the land and its waters, but also to eliminate or restrict access to community assets. By the end of that year, and with the aid of his influential guests, he obtained protected status for his lands, which became the Quixmala Biosphere Reserve. Playing by the well-rehearsed High Society Eugenesis Handbook, villagers and farmers were portrayed as a threat to the delicate balance of a lush ecosystem, pests to be swatted away by the noble businessman turned conservationist. In a 2007 New York Times article, the author describes a scene involving Goffredo Marcaccini, the son-in-law of James Goldsmith, who currently runs this state alongside Jim's daughter. Upon seeing some roadside debris during his ride, he tells the reporter the following. Mother man is the cancer of the earth. We are only here to destroy. Which is pretty rich, considering the impact of his father-in-law's experiments in the area, really. For one thing, Goldsmith bought in non-native species, such as zebras and antelopes, into the Mexican rainforest and spurred the increase of the number of crocodiles in the wetlands. He also altered the flow of water in the marshes and the coastal lake by building a system of dams with floodgates. 
His goal was to regulate the level of water in the wetlands, to avoid their drying out at certain seasons of the year, and thus to have artificial lakes on his estate. This had an impact on fishing on federal property, blocking the natural entry and exit of fish and altering the salinity of the water. Despite these actions, which suggest that the man wasn't beyond bending the environment to better fit his idea of a private paradise, Goldsmith's PR efforts have lasted long after his death, as most references to Quicksmala still cite him as a selfless billionaire, whose ghost occasionally returns from the netherworld, I guess, to fight against constant pressures for deforestation by the noisy tourist industry. Somehow, missing the irony of the fact that after James Goldsmith died in 1997, his heirs eventually converted a portion of the property into the Casa Quixmala Hotel, now open to discerning travelers from around the world for just $800 a night. Which slowly leads us to… Part 4. Assuming the face-eating leopard doesn't eat your face because it's Friday. The rich guys care? No, at least not in a way that doesn't exhibit the same callous disregard for their fellow human beings as their money-making moves, because nature is still business. Now, one very obvious thing to point out about Jim Goldsmith would be that this self-styled environmentalist had taken over Crown Zellerbach Corporation just a few years before settling in at Quixmala, becoming one of the largest owners of timber in the world, and that he later swapped those stakes for gold shares in the new Mont Mining Corporation. But there's little point in focusing on hypocrisy because nobody except the terminally liberal cares about the real or perceived hypocrisy of powerful people. Now, Goldsmith and his heirs have gone to great lengths to not only distinguish their project at Quicksmala from the actions of hotel developers and the wider tourist industry, but also to play up their beef with various representatives and supporters of said industry. Jim Goldsmith and those later inheriting him would have you believe that there was a hint of romanticism, nay, idealism inside the ruthless businessman. With you, baby, it's, it's just different. But it makes little sense to assume that the face-eating leopard would behave in other non-face-eating way outside its regular working hours. Jimmy's MO in all things environmental was pretty much the same as his actions in the cutthroat world of hostile takeovers. In a 1986 book by Moira Johnston, Goldsmith is quoted as saying, I do believe in forests. I do believe in forest lands. Everybody says they're a disaster. But they're still making profits, and forest lands will one day be as valuable as they were. Ah, yes, the entrepreneurial vision of making money out of land and real estate. Mm. And uh, this is where we talk about another retirement age hobby the man picked up, which was whispering into the ears of influential politicians. According to a 1989 Financial Times article, Goldsmith was instrumental in convincing then-Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher to support the adoption of Debt for Nature swaps, which hilariously turned him into a green mole in the eyes of some of his critics. Now, what exactly are Debt for Nature swaps and conservation financing? The idea is that lending nations can buy up debt and forego interest payments if the indebted country will implement specific environmental protection programs for land or water resources on their territory. This doesn't sound bad for like 5 seconds until you realize that the face-eating leopard party never takes a fucking break. A 2017 article titled A Hostile Takeover of Nature, Placing Value in Conservation Finance argues that despite the supposed win-win for all parties involved, these Debt for Nature initiatives end up benefiting lending nations and other already powerful actors. Quote, since the shareholder revolution of the early 1990s, a large majority of firms in the so-called productive economy have been restructured around shareholder ownership 
especially in natural resource sectors like forestry, fossil fuels and agriculture, generally to the detriment of laborers working in these industries. Profits come from breaking up a single property into multiple assets and selling each piece individually. The article identifies three major revenue streams for these lands. Real estate, in the form of offering limited and exclusive access to pristine places for high-end tourism, while restricting access to the same location to natives. Public money, in the form of funds obtained for things like carbon offsets or animal sanctuaries, and commodity production, free trade or organic coffee, timber, what have you. In these cases, conservation private equity firms are drawing in existing social wealth in order to pass it on to their investors. No new wealth is being created in this process, and the taxes that are being paid by these wealthy investors are effectively being returned to them in the guise of returns on their investments. So, conservation finance is not charity. It's not a way to direct market forces to protect nature either. Rather, it's a way to squeeze out profit from countries that have little choice but to accept terms placed in front of them. In other words, it's green grabbing. Thank you for watching and if you've enjoyed this, which I'll assume you have since you're still here unless you're hate watching, well then please like and subscribe to the channel. Bye bye!